So without further ado, please welcome Thomas Suarez. Thank you so much. First thing, I'm going to try not using a microphone. I think you may need it. I may need it? I take back what I say. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you all of you for being here tonight. It is, to say the least, a great honor for me to be speaking to you. My great, great thanks to Jewish Voice for Peace, Interlink Publishing, Media Education Foundation, and Students for Justice in Palestine, not just for making this meeting possible, but for all their efforts towards justice and peace in the Middle East and beyond. The source for everything I will say tonight is cited in my book, State of Terror. Most is taken directly from the classified source documents held by Britain's National Archives. In addition, I have made available online a selection of these source documents. The web address for that is paldocs.net, P-A-L-D-O-C-S dot N-E-T. That page also contains a link to Book Arata. And for any of you that do read the book, I encourage you to check the Arata. The list is short, but it's important. Our topic is, of course, the conflict in Israel-Palestine. No conflict is really a misnomer, but we'll use it for our convenience. And the only reason I should be taking your time here today is if I thought I might have something constructive to offer towards our common goal of an end to this conflict. We are all familiar with the beginnings in late 19th century Europe in a climate of emerging ethnic nationalism, a movement took hold to create a Jewish state in response to anti-Semitism in Europe and Russia. Now at the time, many saw this as a capitulation to bigotry and a forfeiting of, of long fought struggles for equality. Many Jews resented the movement's treatment of them as a race apart and they resented the idea that they should make yet another ghetto, and worse yet, to make it on other people's land. But for others, it did offer the promise of an escape from persecution. Messianic fundamentalism would become the driving engine of the movement, both to posit the settler state as an indigenous movement, and to inspire Jews to people it, because there was a wide disinterest in the project among Jews. And so there was only one possible target for the project, Palestine, because it was the land of the biblical Jewish kingdom. Other locations were considered, but only as stepping stones if necessary. Fast forward to today, and whereas all the other European ethnic nationalist movements have long since failed, this one, Zionism, lives on as the so-called Israel-Palestine conflict. One need not question the motivation of any individual involved with Zionism's beginnings to point out that ultimately, the settler state itself became the goal. Anti-Semitism and persecuted Jews became the means. The racialized nature of this settler movement has been the cause of a century of misery, displacement, and death. And it is arguably the epicenter of the destabilization of the Middle East as a whole. Yet, we have all been conditioned to think of an end to this conflict as almost a fantasy. Indeed, we are led to believe that it is so complicated as to be virtually unsolvable. But this mindset is itself much of the problem. It has conditioned us to accept this tragedy as self-perpetuating. The conflict is, in truth, remarkably simple. An ethnic nationalist movement seeks to establish a settler state on other people's land. The people resist. That's the conflict. Everything else is just details. And today's instant global communications makes this more blatant than ever. The never-ending theft of land, the never-ending ethnic cleansing, repression, siege, dehumanization, racism, and these punctuated by major terror attacks. Protectovic, Kaslev, Sovereignjatila, Kipia. To cite just a few of these, and most of the victims in these attacks were already refugees victims of the settler movement's ethnic cleansing. The human toll of protective edge alone, that was the attacks against Gaza July 2014, was roughly equivalent to our 9-11 terror attacks. Protective edge had slightly fewer people killed, but there were about twice the casualties, including 1,000 children left permanently disabled. And to keep the comparison accurate, imagine if the terrorists of 9-11 
had destroyed vital infrastructure upon which the health of the entire population depended, and then been able to block us from rebuilding it, causing yet more misery and death. But we are told, as we have been since the siege of Gaza began in 1948, no, not since the election of Hamas, but 1948, that Israel was acting in self-defense. The conflict could end tomorrow if our own governments, the United States, the United Kingdom, the European Union, stopped enabling it. And lest my claim sound exaggerated, just imagine for a moment how the international community would react if the ethnicities in this conflict were reversed. Think about that. It really would end tomorrow. So, ending the conflict, in my view, requires deconstructing and exposing the mechanism that maintains this complete inversion of reality. And that means examining the narrative that informs the public understanding of the issue, which is Israel's creation myth, its autobiography, its self-identity. Israel spins itself as not merely a political entity like any other nation state, but as the rebirth of the Old Testament kingdom whose name Zionist leaders adopted for that strategic purpose, striking a powerful chord in the collective Western subconscious. <coughs> this messianic narrative had to be made inseparable from the nation state, and to accomplish this, Israel encapsulated it into a this seemingly innocuous term, the Jewish state. But Israel uses this term as a human shield, hiding behind it to insulate itself from accountability. This self-identity as the Jewish state, not a Jewish state, but the Jewish state, is altogether unlike any other country's relationship with any other religion or cultural group. Judaism is not Israel's state religion in the sense of a national faith that any nation might adopt. Rather, Israel presents itself as the very embodiment of Jewry itself, of Judaism, Jewish history, culture, and persecution. And it is to assert this implicit ownership over all Jewry that Israel refuses to allow Israeli nationality. By Israeli law, the nationality of Jewish citizens of Israel is Jewish, and repeated legal challenges to this abuse have all failed. Any acknowledgement that a Jewish individual might be free of an intrinsic obligatory connection to Israel would undermine its messianic self-identity, its pretense as the common destiny of Jews because they are Jews. Zionism freed nationalism from the constraints of geographic borders, making ethnicity itself the frontier. Nationalism and what Zionist leaders considered to be the Jewish race were made one and the same in the service of the settler state. Thus Israel, taken at its word, makes Jews, simply by virtue of being Jews, partner to whatever it does. And the profound anti-Semitism of, of this is, to me, self-evident. A principal justification being cited by the defenders of Israel's actions is that Zionism is Jewish self-determination. We hear this all the time now. No, it is exactly the opposite. It is a theft of Jewish individual self-identity and self-determination. Zionism as a political movement might have survived as nothing more than an odd footnote in history had Britain, for its own geopolitical reasons, not taken up its cause. And we are, we are now, of course, in the centennial of Britain's original sin in this tragedy, the Balfour Declaration. What is clear in British source documents from the time is that Balfour and the other officials involved knew knew all along that the Zionists intended to take all of Palestine and expel non-Jews from it. Behind the scenes, activists like Chaim Weizmann and Baron Rothschild were demanding the entire region for the Zionist state, treated the ethnic cleansing of non-Jewish Palestinians as indispensable to their plans, and insisted that the British lie about the scheme until it is too late for anyone to do anything about it. In correspondence with Balfour, Weizmann justified his lies with racist slurs against the Palestinians and against Jews, that is, non-Zionist Jews, and especially the Middle East's indigenous Jews, who were overwhelmingly opposed to Zionism and whom Weizmann smeared with classic anti-Semitic stereotypes. The Palestinians, the Palestinians he dismissed as, in so many words, a lower type of human. And this was among the reasons he and other Zionist leaders 
used for refusing simple democracy in Palestine. If the Arab, the Palestinians, had the vote, he said, it would reduce the Jew down to the level of a native, his word. And speaking of choice of words, the ability of language to spark across rational thought and instead tell us what to think rather than simply communicate has always been especially important in this issue. And so it was with a major buzzword during the British mandate, Jewish immigration. What's wrong with Jewish immigration? How can anybody be against that? But we need to keep in mind that this was not immigration in the normal sense of the word. It was rather the extranationalization of the land. By the 1920s, four decades of Palestinian protest against the dispossession of land, labor, and resources had proved futile. And the late 1920s brought the first of two Palestinian uprisings. Palestinian terrorists were loosely knit groups operating outside the Palestinian villages. In contrast, Zionist terror organizations operated from within the settlements and were actively empowered and shielded by those settlements and by the Jewish agency, the, the recognized semi-autonomous ruling body of the settlements, what would become the Israeli government. And whereas the Palestinian villages did help to some extent in ending Palestinian terror, Zionist settlements were party to the terrorism, shielded and funded the terrorists, and steadfastly refused any cooperation in stopping the terror. Now, there were, of course, of course there were many among the Jewish settlements who were horrified at the terrorism. But if they became vocal, they would, for example, find their cars blown up. While those who became more actively opposed were not so lucky. Three major terror organizations dominated Palestine during these years. The Haganah, formed in 1920 and in large part trained by the British, was originally a defensive militia in the sense that it defended the settlement from reprisals. Its offshoot, the Irgun, was formed in 1931 to engage in more indiscriminate terror, and the Irgun's offshoot, Lehi, better known as the Stern Gang after its first leader, was formed in late 1940 by Irgun members who saw no difference between the Allied powers and the Axis powers, and therefore saw no reason to moderate their terror during World War II. The Haganah, and the Irgun did not stop their terror during the war, but they toned it down for a while. But this was, however, purely pragmatic. In late 1942, Irgun head and future Israeli Prime Minister Malachim Begin judged that an Allied victory, contrary to what he had earlier thought, would not necessarily guarantee a Zionist state. And so halfway through the war, the Irgun also abandoned restraint, and the Haganah soon followed suit. Although their styles and their focus was different, there was, in my opinion, no substantive difference between the Irgun and Lehi and the Jewish agency's Haganah. The Jewish agency often cooperated and collaborated with the Irgun and Lehi and even helped finance the Irgun. The Jewish agency would condemn Irgun and Lehi terror, but with rare exception, steadfastly refused any help in ending it. And when they did, it was often for pragmatic or political reasons. A British analysis was that the Hakama would let the Irgun in particular carry out terror attacks so that the Jewish agency could feign innocence. By 1948, even the superficial differences among the three gangs vanished. These terror organizations attacked anyone in their way, Palestinian, Jew, or British. The Jewish agency tolerated little dissent and sought to dictate the fates of all Jews. And so the indoctrination of Jewish children was vital to the Zionist project. The first time I am aware of this coming to wide public light was on the 8th of July, 1938. That day, the Irgun blew up a bus filled with Palestinian villagers. Now, this was not the first time the Irgun had done something of this sort. But this time, the British caught the alleged bomber. She was a 12-year-old schoolgirl, apparently egged on by three adults. Jewish teenagers, both boys and girls, were commonly used to carry out terror attacks, and this continued throughout to the ethnic cleansing of 1948. For example, when shortly before the partition resolution of November 1947, the British uncovered a Lehi terror school, many of the inductees were, to quote the British, 
children of tender years, both boys and girls. Adolescents of both sexes were among the terror militia that massacred the village of Dar Yassin several months later, Dar Yassin being the best known, but just one of many such massacres. Teachers were threatened or removed if they tried to intervene in the indoctrination of their students, and the students themselves were blocked from advancement if they resisted. Jews who opposed and tried to warn of the emerging Zionist fascism were assassinated. And indeed, most victims of Zionist assassinations, that is a targeted individual rather than uh, a, a, a indiscriminate murder with a bombing, were Jews. Palestinian armed resistance ended before the outbreak of World War II. Through to late 1947, there were virtually no Palestinian attacks. As Zionist terror ravaged Palestine and brought the country to its knees, Palestinians maintained stoic nonviolence. A British explanation for the Palestinians' refusal to respond in kind was that they understood that the attacks were a trap intended to elicit blowback that the Zionists would frame as a threat against which they would have to defend themselves. This was the tactic used to ignite the Civil War of 1948 that the Zionists needed. And it, of course, remains Israel's principal strategy today. Terrorize until there is a reaction, then broadcast that reaction as an unprovoked attack. As, for example, with protective edge, cast lead, and so many other atrocities. To be treated as most secret is the red ink heading of the transcript of a key meeting of 20 people, including the top Zionist leaders, held in London on the 9th of September, 1941, setting the direction for Palestine's future. It is worth summarizing from this because it is typical of what went on behind the scenes, and it is an almost comical laying bare of the hypocrisy of Zionists, now Israeli, claims of democracy and equal rights. Indeed, the conversation sounds like it anticipates George Orwell's then still to be written political satire, Animal Farm. Present were Weizmann, who had called the meeting, David Ben-Gurion, and other Zionist leaders, such as Simon Marks of Marks and Spencer, and the prominent non-Zionist industrialist, Robert Whaley Cohen. There is nothing left to the imagination the takeover and ethnic cleansing of all Palestine remained the plan. Anthony Rothschild began by stressing that there would be, quote, no discrimination against any group of its citizens in the Jewish state. Weizmann and Ben-Gurion also assured the skeptics present. Arabs, Palestinians, would have equal rights. However, they clarified that, well, within that absolute equality, Jewish settlers would have to have special privileges. And so Weizmann's, quote, absolute equality required the transfer of most non-Jews out of Palestine while permitting, quote, a certain percentage of Arab and other elements, whatever other elements is he doesn't explain, to remain in his Jewish state, the insinuation being as a pool of cheap labor. Rothschild's vision of equality and non-discrimination was equally compelling. It, quote, depended on turning an Arab majority into a minority. And to achieve this, there would be, quote, no equal rights for non-Jews. Cohen, the industrialist, found the scheme terrifying. He submitted that the Zionists were, and I quote him, starting with the kinds of aims with which Hitler had started. He proposed instead that the state not be predicated on race, that it not be predicated on religion, and that it be named with a neutral geographic term. He proposed that the state should be named Palestine. The others were horrified at this idea, arguing that if the state did not have a Jewish name, quote, they would never get a Jewish majority, acknowledging the use of messianic fundamentalism as a political strategy for the settler state. In another obvious but never publicly spoken admission, Ben-Gurion clarified that his Jewish state was not based on Judaism. It was rather based on Jews as a race, which until Zionism had been classic anti-Semitism. Asked about the borders of his settler state, Weizmann continued in the same surreal manner. He replied that he would consider the partition plan proposed by the Peel Commission four years earlier in 1937, but that the line, the partition, would be the Jordan, 
But this was nonsensical, that Jordan was the commission's eastern boundary for the two states. He went further still. He would very much, he said, like to cross the Jordan, that is, take Transjordan along with Palestine. At the end of the meeting, Weizmann sought to put his proposals into effect officially in the name of all the Jews. Those against his proposals were, in his word, anti-Semites. As they were discussing the occupation and ethnic cleansing of Palestine, World War II was raging. What was the Jewish agency's reaction to the most terrible enemy Jewry has ever known? From the beginning, it was not to encourage the Yisha, the Jewish settlers, to enlist in the Allied struggle against the Nazis until it was under circumstances that would further Zionism, which did not happen until the last year of the war with the so-called Jewish Brigade, an inefficient encumbrance on the Allies whose purpose was to further Zionist goals. It was to conduct a theft ring of Allied weapons and munitions, as if, as one British military record put it, as if paid by Hitler himself. It was to continue the violence in Palestine, taking resources and personnel away from the war effort. And it was to exploit the Allies' war exhaustion. Ben Gurion had long planned to exploit the Allies' end of war weakness to his strategic advantage. And so, by 1944, the Haganah began ratcheting up its terror. Desperate, the British mounted a public plea to the Yisha, explaining that their terror was making the struggle against the Nazis all the more difficult. I'll read a few excerpts from it. Palestine has enjoyed five years of virtual immunity from the horrors of war but has been the scene of a series of outrageous crimes of violence by Jewish terrorists to force their political aims. These events are proceeding side by side with the bitterest phase of the critical fighting between the United Nations, that is the Allied forces, and Nazi Germany. The plea was ignored and the terror increased. The exploitation of the war continued after the Allied victory when the Jewish agency sought to exploit the fact that Britain's struggle against the Nazis had brought it to economic ruin. There was a move to pressure the United States not to approve its post-war loan to Britain unless Britain acceded to Zionist demands. Much has been written on the collaboration between the Zionists and the fascists during the war, the best known, of course, being the Havara transfer agreement that broke the anti-Nazi boycott. One of the least known was Leahy's attempted collaboration with the Italian fascists. In its nearly concluded so-called Jerusalem Agreement of late 1940, Leahy offered to support a fascist victory in the war, in exchange for which the Italian fascists would use their military power to forcibly uproot Jewish communities and move their populations to Palestine. Now, if this sounds like a scheme so extreme that only fanatical Leahy could have conjured it, it is essentially what the Israeli state ultimately succeeded at in the early 1950s, most catastrophically when it conducted a false flag terror campaign against Jews in Iraq to forcibly move its population to Israel as ethnic fodder, destroying that ancient Jewish community. Many German Jewish immigrants to Palestine during the war were outraged by the Zionist exploitation of the Nazi horrors they had just fled. This outrage was given voice by, among others, the prominent journalist Robert Felch, who had been editor of a Berlin newspaper until that paper was banned by the Nazis in 1938. Felch warned that Zionist leaders, quote, have not yet understood that the enemy seeks the destruction of the Jews. We, who have been here only a few years, we know what Nazism is. The Zionists, rather, are, quote, taking part in the crash of European Jewry only as spectators. Now I paraphrase, fighting the British and keeping Jews from joining the Allied struggle while getting comfortable and rich from their political project in Palestine. Recent immigrants from Germany and Central Europe, he said, have no representation among the Zionist ruling establishment. If they did, quote, we would have demanded that the Yisha should put itself at the disposal of Britain for the fight against Hitler and Nazism. But, and I am still quoting him, they do not want to fight against Hitler because his fascist methods are also theirs. They do not want our young men to join the forces, the Allied forces. Day after day, they are sabotaging the English war effort. These German Jewish immigrants were shunned by the Zionists 
their publications and their presses bombed. Even kiosks were bombed by the Zionists for selling non-Hebrew papers to German Jewish immigrants. In 1943, a man whom British records describe as, quote, a Jew whose integrity is not open to question, risked his life to warn about the threat of Zionism. For his safety, he was referred to only by the code name Z. Z described Zionism as a parallel movement to Nazism. He warned that the Zionist indoctrination of Jewish youth was producing a society of extremists who will use any method necessary to achieve Zionist goals. And he pointed out that as fascism in Europe has demonstrated, such a society is very difficult to undo once it has taken root. How trustworthy is this anonymous testimony? Well, I found at the National Archives a private letter in which Z is identified. He was J.S. Bentwich, Senior Inspector of Jewish Schools in Palestine. A report by U.S. intelligence in the Middle East dated the 4th of June, 1943, was entitled Latest Aspects of the Palestine Zionist Arab Problem, not the Jewish Arab Problem, the Zionist Arab Problem. The report described Zionism in Palestine as, quote, a type of nationalism, which in any other country would be stigmatized as retrograde Nazism, and stated that anti-Semitism was essential to it. Whereas, quote, assimilated Jews in Europe and America are noted for being stout opponents of racialism and discrimination, Zionism has bred the opposite mentality. The report refuted Zionist propaganda about, having, about the Zionists having made the desert bloom it noted the irony that it was from the Palestinians that the settlers learned, among many other things, the cultivation of the Yaffa oranges. And whereas the Palestinians were self-sufficient, the Zionist settlements exist only on massive external financing. And should the settlements ever have to survive on their own merits, as the Palestinians do, quote, the venture will collapse like a pricked balloon. The conclusion of this early U.S. intelligence report was, however, naive, or at least it was premature. Now that the world, quote, has seen the lengths to which the Nazi creed has carried the nations, it reasoned that the Zionists, quote, are due to find themselves an anachronism. Now, I'd like to just say a word about all these Nazi-Zionist parallels, which continued with the behavior of the early Israeli state, but at, uh, since have, of course, become uh, quite a taboo. For me, I don't make this comparison unless I'm quoting historical material that, that uh, sheds light on what people were saying at the time. The reason I don't make the parallel myself is in part because it's a distraction, but also I object to the idea that we, we need to be jarred by the word Nazi and its reference to European suffering in order to acknowledge that generations of people in Palestine, in the many refugee camps, and indeed within Israel, have been robbed of normal lives so that a privileged race can rule. In the cause of Zionism, Gaza has been reduced to a laboratory for sadism and weapons proving. In the cause of Zionism, human beings have been reduced to subhuman. That is the reality. We should not need the word Nazism in order to see that. The most deadly terror attack of the entire mandate period <clears throat> provides a good illustration of the Jewish agency's priorities regarding persecuted Jews versus the settler project. And this most deadly terror attack was not the bombing of the King David Hotel in 1946, as is often thought. Even some of the Irgun's bombings of Palestinian markets killed more people than died in the King David Hotel attack. But the single most deadly was the Jewish agency's bombing of the immigrant ship Patria in 1940, killing an estimated 267 people, most of whom were Jews fleeing the Nazis. Now, the Jewish agency bombed the Patria because it was bringing the DPs to Mauritius, where they would be safe from the war and where the British had facilities for them. But the Zionist settler project needed them in Palestine. So the Zionist version of history is that the agency meant only to disable the ship. Well, of course it meant only to disable the ship. But this is an absurd argument. When you blow up a ship, you cannot then say that you didn't mean to hurt anybody. The fact is that the agency placed Zionism, its need for ethnically correct settlers, 
about the lives of the people. In further violence against its Jewish victims, the agency framed them for its crime and exploited them for propaganda. It spread the lie that the DPs themselves blew up the vessel, that they committed mass suicide because they could not bear not to go directly to Palestine, posthumously exploiting the people they had killed to serve the Zionist narrative. Nor was this the only immigrant ship that the Jewish agency bombed for its own political reasons. Its bombing of the Empire Lifeguard seven years later lacked even the patria's disingenuous justification. That vessel was bringing Jewish DPs to Palestine for permanent settlement, precisely what the Zionists wanted. But simply as a sneer to the British, since it was a British vessel, the agency had it rigged with a time bomb, risking everyone aboard to the accuracy of a detonator timer, the fickleness of the seas, and unpredictable maritime delays. The hope was that, that for the bomb to explode after the DPs were off. As it happened, the bomb exploded as the passengers were disembarking. Further mocking the alleged role of the settler project as a safe haven for persecuted Jews, the agency would take immigration permits intended for European survivors and give them instead to Americans and British who were comfortable and at no risk, but who made better settlers. In general, most countries did not open their doors to the DPs, the displaced people, as they should have. The United States among them. And this is cited as a principal reason why Zionists fought to increase Jewish immigration to Palestine. What is clear, however, is that most Zionist leaders wanted it that way. They did not want Jews to have any option by Palestine. The settler project needed them, and that was the overriding consideration, not the welfare of the war's survivors. As but one example, in early 1944, President Roosevelt succeeded in principle in establishing a half million new homes for European DPs, most of these homes in the United States and Britain. U.S. Zionist leaders were outraged and sabotaged it. When Roosevelt's aide, Morris Ernst, confronted U.S. Zionist leaders in an attempt to save the program, he was, in his words, thrown out of parlors and accused of treason. Why treason? Treason because Morris Ernst was Jewish and the Zionists claimed to own Jews. As Ernst bitterly put it, the offer of new homes in the United States endangered what he called the Zionist pet thesis. The pet thesis being that Jews must only go to Palestine because they are Jews. Nor were those already settled safe. In 1946, the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Palestine, Yitzhak Herzog, went to Europe to forcibly remove orphans of Jewish background from their adopted European families. Removing 10,000 children from their homes was the number he cited to the New York Times as his goal. In the National Archives, I found a record, uh, his, a copy of uh, his record of the trip. In it, Herzog complains of the fierce resistance he met from horrified local Jewish leaders who tried to protect the children but he used his political clout to circumvent them. In France, for example, facing the steadfast refusal of the Jewish leaders to betray the children, Herzog said, I demanded promulgation of a law which would oblige every family to declare the particulars of the children in houses. Now I paraphrase, so that those of Jewish background could be exposed and shipped to Palestine. To me, this is a Kafkaesque twist on Passover for these children who had just been spared the Nazis. For me, I call it kidnapping. Herzog's justification was that for a child of Jewish background to be raised in a non-Jewish home is, quote, much worse than physical murder. Yet even this fundamentalist justification fails to explain what was actually taking place. Because at the same time Herzog was rescuing Jewish children from this fate much worse than physical murder, his Jewish agency colleagues were sabotaging Jewish adoptive homes in England for young survivors still in the camps. The real reason for all of it, of course, was that the children were needed to serve Zionism as demographic fodder. To that end, the Jewish agency had coerced President Truman to segregate Jewish DPs into Zionist-run camps despite objections even from fiercely pro-Zionist Churchill that this echoed Nazi behavior. The camps nurtured such fanaticism 
that had shocked a joint US-UK committee that visited them in 1946. Before these camps, the evidence is that few Jewish DPs wanted to go to Palestine. But now, the committee found these DPs in a delirious state, threatening mass suicide if they did not go to Palestine. Even the offer of new homes in the United States, which was made, and which had always been the favorite destination, was now suddenly met with threats of mass suicide. DPs were also groomed to bring Zionist terrorism to Europe, bombing Allied trains and Allied facilities. The bombing of the British Embassy in Rome in 1946, for example, was aided by DPs brainwashed in these camps. As was a near catastrophe in the Austrian Alps in the summer of 1947, when DPs nearly blew an Allied train off a steep trestle into a deep abyss, which would almost certainly have sent its 200 civilians and Allied troops returning home to their deaths. Behind closed doors, the Jewish agency discussed its obstacles and what it considered problems in the 1940s says quite a lot about the present. These were democracy, the Atlantic Charter, which of course became the basis for the United Nations, reconstruction was a source of worry, and the fall in anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism having always been Zionism's alleged justification, without <coughs> which it would be irrelevant. The agency blamed what it believed to be declining in anti-Semitism in the United States on what it called America's, quote, democratic attitude. Now, today, when anything approaching this topic is raised, it is often misunderstood as the speaker, in this case me, blaming Jews for anti-Semitism. No, rather it is the fact that Zionism requires anti-Semitism and that the Zionists exploited it at the expense of Jews. I also mentioned post-war reconstruction. To paraphrase from a British report, Zionist leaders were afraid that with the improvement of conditions in Europe, the pressure on Palestine would subside. By 1946, Zionist terrorism had become the defining daily challenge of life in Palestine, and 100,000 British troops proved unable to contain it. Anyone or anything that kept Palestine a functioning society was a target of the Zionists. Trains, roads, bridges, communications, oil facilities, and Coast Guard stations were constantly being bombed. Soldiers, utility workers, telephone repairmen, railway workers, bomb disposal personnel were murdered. Police, and especially Jewish police, were long a favorite target of the Zionists and were gunned down by the dozens, typically shot in the back with the assassin then slipping into the safety of a nearby settlement. Another tactic to murder, murder police was to use false calls for help to trick 405 into entering a house rigged to blow up. Among the smaller terror organizations that popped up was one specifically dedicated to the Zionist long-running fear of Jews befriending non-Jews. The ultimate fear, of course, being polluting what for the Zionists was the pure Jewish race. As a sample of its methods, the terror group is said to have doused a disobedient Jewish girl with acid, severely injuring her and blinding her in one eye. Zionist terror was aided by the Jewish agency's phenomenal intelligence network. The agency had informers all the way to high-placed sympathetic U.S. officials, such that the British learned not even to trust direct messages to U.S. President Truman. When the U.N.'s Palestine Committee, UNSCUP, visited Palestine in the summer of 1947, the agency had already replaced the committee members, drivers, with spies, had replaced the waiters at the main restaurant they frequented with spies, and most productively sent five young women to serve at what they called a theater network of house attendants at the building where the UNSCUP committee, all men, were being housed. The young women were required to be smart and educated, but above all, in the agency's word, the young women were required to be daring. Whatever daring meant, they extracted a wealth of information from the key people who were deciding Palestine's future. Jewish sex workers were involuntarily recruited as spies. They were told that upon the Zionist victory, which they were assured was imminent, they would be executed for cavorting with the enemy, but might be spared if they cooperated as spies now. The practice was so widespread that a standard questionnaire was printed up that the women were to fill out after each British customer. 
Illustrative of the degree to which Zionist plans infiltrated the government in everyday life, a couple of months after one Coast Guard station was attacked and bombed by the Haganah, it blew up again, but the British were baffled because the second time there had been no attack. It just blew up. They discovered that the construction crew that had rebuilt the station after the previous attack were Haganah and had simply embedded explosives in the reconstruction. But the worst problem of infiltration was in the military service, where deadly sabotage by Zionist plants who had joined the forces led, tragically, to orders to remove all Jews from service in Palestine because there was no way to tell the Zionists from the Jews. By 1948, this problem spread to key medical personnel. After the Jewish agency poisoned the water supply of Acker with typhoid in order to expedite the ethnic cleansing of this city that lies on the Palestinian side of partition, the bacteriologist hired by the British proved to be a Haganah plant of sympathizer, an obstacle to the availability of the vaccine. A dramatic example of Zionist exploitation of the war's Jewish survivors is the iconic Zionist immigrant story, the vessel Exodus. The British, posterity has it, sent the passengers back to Europe, destroying their last hope of a normal life in their promised land. The reality, however, is that this was a cynical, sadistic marketing theater for the Jewish agency who blocked opportunities of freedom and new lives for the survivors to manufacture sympathy victims. To paraphrase Israeli professor Eva Zertal, the greater the suffering of these survivors of the Holocaust, the greater their political and media effectiveness for the Zionists. And bear in mind, bear in mind that the entire human cargo of the Exodus, 4,515 people, was less than 1% of President Roosevelt's resettlement scheme that was sabotaged three years earlier. A few months after the Exodus, in November 1947, the UN violating its own charter, blocked Palestinian self-determination, and recommended partition with the implicit creation of a Zionist state. Resolution 181 and the creation of the Israeli state was the direct capitulation to Zionist terrorism, the surrender of the certainty of that continuing terrorism against the West. Caving to that terrorism left the Palestinians as the sole victims of that continuing terrorism. The alternate UN plan was for a binational state, which the British believed that the Palestinians would have reluctantly supported as a compromise to their desire, and absolute right, for a democratic state. But this compromise would be, to quote then secret British documents, totally unacceptable to the Zionists, and quote, would therefore be followed by an intensification of Jewish terrorism. That is, an intensification of the terrorism over that which had already brought Palestine to its knees. The disproportionately large land area that the UN gave the Zionists was also in fear of Zionist terrorism. Again, quoting British sources, giving the Zionists so much land up front was an attempt to delay, not prevent, but delay the, the Zionist expansionist wars that they knew would come. This appeasement, of course, failed because within a few months of Resolution 181, the Zionist militias were already waging their first expansionist war, confiscating more than, the, than half of the Palestinian side of partition. Indeed, British and U.S. documents <clears throat> prove that both governments knew all along that the Zionist acceptance of Resolution 181 was a fraud and knew that the Palestinian state it promised would never be. The Americans knew it, the British knew it, and most of all, the Palestinians knew it. And this, not just the Palestinian refusal to forfeit their right to self-determination, was why their negotiators could not agree to Resolution 181. But at the end of the day, the fact that the British were occupying Palestine enabled Zionist leaders to juxtapose their war of expropriation as a liberation movement, a war of independence. The armistice that ended the 1948 war established a ceasefire line <coughs> that, quote, to read from the agreement, is not to be construed in any sense as a political or territorial boundary. That is, Israel was supposed to return to the agreed partition, but it simply refused. Even if one accepts the legality of partition, the Israeli occupation of Palestinian land began then, not in 1967. 
We today have the sense that the situation calmed after 1948. This is false. What changed is that the victims no longer included Europeans. Zionist, now Israeli, ethnic cleansing and terror attacks continued post-statehood, evolving with a new, new situation. Israel now holding up the untenable catastrophe it had created and refused to rectify as a threat against which it now had to defend itself. This refusal to rectify its crimes was, and remains today, a complete abrogation of the agreements upon which its admittance to the United Nations was conditioned. But, okay, here we are seven decades later and a century after Balfour. What happens next? How finally do we fix this instead of forever talking about it? How finally do we bring peace? Increasingly, it is clear that the only possible solution is what should have happened in 1948, a single, democratic, secular state of equals. The good news is that, thanks to Israeli aggression, we're halfway there. The conflict is typically framed in terms of an Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands, with the logical solution being an end to that occupation and presumably the creation of a Palestinian state, the two-state solution. It is high time to acknowledge that this is fantasy, a fantasy kept alive by some to ensure a never-ending bogus peace process. Israel, in its quest to finish its unfinished business of 1948, has not only discarded partition, which it did 70 years ago, but has also discarded the 1949 armistice line, essentially the so-called 67 borders, and it has made a single state. The two-state solution if ever it was a good idea, was dead by the end of 1948. Nor is this new thinking. In January of 1949, the eminent war correspondent Anne O'Hare McCormick pronounced the two-state solution dead due to Israeli aggression. Since then, of course, it has grown ever more impossible. As Israel builds a matrix of settlements, everything from outposts to veritable cities, complete with apartheid roads, the matrix designed specifically to prevent a Palestinian state. And the two-state solution would not fix the problem of apartheid within Israel, the most horrific part of that apartheid being the continuing blocking of those it had ethnically cleansed. But thanks to Israel, we have in reality now a single state encompassing Israel, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, and the Golan Heights a single state divided into various ghettos of apartheid and prison. But so far, this is hidden behind a fig leaf, a fig leaf made in Oslo. The Palestinian Authority, a make-believe government that has no power, no autonomy, no mandate, and exists only at the pleasure of the United States and Israel, the very adversaries of the people it is supposed to represent. Israel benefits hugely from this mirage, strategically, politically, and economically. Most obviously, it serves to explain why non-Jews in the occupied lands cannot vote in Israeli elections, even though it is Tel Aviv, not Ramallah, that dictates their lives. The end to the conflict begins when we deprive this conflict of its smoke and mirrors, and when we acknowledge that there is a single state. Once this is obvious, who can argue against making it a free state? Who could object to making everybody in it equal? An end to apartheid, an end to the race laws, and in their place, democracy, secularism, and equality. Inequality inescapably, meaning the unqualified right of return. You can't ethnically cleanse people and then say, well, equality does not apply to you because you're not here. That would be a farce. Apartheid began on a gargantuan scale with the ethnic cleansing of 1948. In closing, there are many sources of injustice in the world over which we have no direct control. Israel-Palestine is one over which we do, because it is our own government's strategic, economic, and political support that keeps it going. Justice and peace for everyone in Israel-Palestine will come when the people finally able to see the conflict for what it is demanding.